So the past four weeks before today, we've been the season of Advent. We used to have the, the candles up here and all the decorations. And as you know, the, the season of Advent is, is a season of preparation. The word Advent means to arrive on the scene. And during this season, we've prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. In, uh, on Christmas morning, the songs, the messages from Scripture all helped us to anticipate the birth of Jesus. And we've possibly felt a little of the same sort of feeling that those from centuries ago had as they were anxiously awaiting the arrival of the Messiah. But now, we're in the time after his coming. Christmas is past. Jesus was born. He was born as a baby in Bethlehem. He walked the dusty trails of Galilee. He taught the multitudes He was hated by the religious leaders. He was falsely accused. He was cruelly executed. He bore the wrath of God for sin, but he also received God's favor and was resurrected from the dead. All that happened a long time ago. So what now? Kind of similar to we're now after Christmas. Celebrations are over. The gifts have been given and they've been unwrapped and the mounds of torn wrapping paper have been thrown in the trash. We're taking down the decorations. We're going back to our regular work schedules. So what now? Well, we're once again in a period of waiting. Jesus came once, but then he left. And now he was very clear to his disciples that it was necessary that he leave. He said that it was good for us, actually, that he, he were, that for him to go away. He was very clear that he was not coming back immediately. He told a parable in Luke chapter 19. It says, Luke 19, 11, it says that as they were listening to this, he was talking to someone else, and he said, as he listened to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. And this, so this happened as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for the last time, to, to approaching his crucifixion. It happens right after the event with Zacchaeus, and he's walking along from Jericho, and he's talking to them, And he's talking to the disciples, he's talking to the crowds, and the verse tells us why he told the parable. He told the parable because they thought that the kingdom was going to come. They thought, they hoped that as he was on his way to Jerusalem, that he was going there to take the throne. They hoped that he would kick the Romans out and that he he would restore Israel to their place of prominence uh, in fulfillment that we see of a lot of Old Testament prophecies. And so this parable he told it was, he told them specifically in order to say, that's not what's going to happen right now. At least not yet. Because in verse 12, he is, then goes on to say, this is Luke 19, verse 12. Therefore he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then to return. So he, he, Jesus is giving warning that he's going away, but then he would also return later. So he's going away. He's not immediately going to be setting up his kingdom. And then the rest of the parable in Luke chapter 19, we're not going to go through this right now, but the rest of the parable all has to do with what we're supposed to be doing while he's gone, while we're waiting for him to come back. This is the parable of the minas. It's kind of similar to the parable of the talents. He, the nobleman who goes away gives a, a mina, which is a significant amount of number, money. I'm estimating around like equivalent to like $250,000 in our terms, gives this to each of ten servants, and each one was expected to use that money in a way that glorified their master, that served his purposes, benefited him. And then the master did return. And when he returned, he called each of the servants to account for what they did with the money he had given them. So this is what the parable that he told to say, look, I'm going to be gone, and I'm going to have some expectations for you while I'm gone. And I'm going to come back, and we're going to, we're going to see how that works out. And so just as Jesus said, he did depart. He ascended back into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And although Jesus was inaugurated as king, he was recognized to be the rightful king of Israel, the king of the world, he does not yet sit on the throne of David. And, I mean, many other things, although there's kind of all this already but not yet tension that goes on with Jesus uh, departing. Although he defeated sin and death, we still see sin and death all around us. It's part of our experience living in this world. 
It has not been eradicated. We still experience pain and sorrow. We still struggle with sin. So we're in that tension, but Jesus promised, he promised that he would return. He would come back. He said this to his disciples in John 14, verse 3. He said, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will, I will come back and take you to myself so that where I am, you will be also. And then another time he promised to return, it was actually angels that said it for him, He's, is in, uh, when he ascended, Acts chapter 1. He declared that he would return. It's this way in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. It says, after he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing, that's the disciples, were gazing into heaven. Suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. Those are angels. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way you have seen him going into heaven. Jesus will return. This is the, this will be the culmination of the ages. For those of us in Christ, it will be a glorious reunion. It will be a time of great joy. But we have to wait. Until that time, we are in a period of waiting. And it's not going to be an easy wait. It's just like it was for the, Israel, the Israelites as they were waiting for their promised Messiah. It's not an easy time of waiting. But what are we supposed to do while we wait? How then shall we live if in between the first advent and the second advent? Well, the Apostle Peter wrote his second letter in part to answer that question. Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter. That's where we're going to be this morning. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter wrote this second letter uh, near the end of his life. He wrote it to many different churches, probably to the same churches he wrote the first letter, his first letter to, 1 Peter, which are churches around the northern area of what we call Turkey today. And he had written that first letter to prepare them for persecution, because he knew persecution was coming. And now, in this second letter that he writes, it's kind of like his final words to the church. Not just to those churches, but to the church as a whole. These are the final words of the Apostle Peter to the church, and it's written to strengthen us for the tough times that we're going to have until Jesus returns. Peter knew that the time while we wait would be characterized by persecution, be characterized by struggle, by proliferation of false teachers who try to lead the church astray. And Peter's burden for his readers, his burden for the churches, his burden for us would be, is that we would remain faithful in the midst of all of these difficulties. He desired that the churches then, he desires for now that we wouldn't just survive, but that we would actually thrive, that we would actually be fruitful despite all the challenges of this time. Now the way that Peter does this in this letter, just to kind of review some of the earlier parts of the letter, first of all, he reminds the churches, he reminds us of the resources that God has provided for us, what he's given to us. First, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, says that God has given us everything, everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Christ. Everything. And so this knowledge that Peter's keying in on, he's saying that's the most important resource, the knowledge of Christ, knowledge about Christ, experiential and relational knowledge of Christ, knowledge lived out in daily life. That's our most important resource. And Peter wants the churches to be established in that truth, to be firmly rooted, to be living godly, fruitful lives. That's what he wants for this church, for Carlton Oaks. But the thing is, that takes effort. That takes work. You cannot be passive. You must make effort to live in accordance with that truth that we know. Now also, as he goes along, knowing that many deniers of that truth would come along, Peter also spends time reminding us, reminding the churches of the source of that truth that we have. And the source is God. 
The knowledge of the truth that we have is from the writings of the prophets and the testimony of the apostles. And those words are God's words. But again, recognizing that there were many who denied that truth, Peter went on on a bit of an attack against these false teachers who would deny that, who would lead people astray. In chapter 2 of the letter, Peter warns of the danger of these false teachers who would come in. He warns that they will try to lead us astray by by luring us with the freedom to indulge in our own fleshly desires. And they'll, they'll make it sound good. They'll make it sound okay with all kinds of plausible arguments. And he get, kind of gives this profile sketch of those false teachers, telling us about their arrogance and their sensuality. And one of the key features that we see about these false teachers is that they denied that Jesus was coming back. They denied that any judgment was coming. They said, yeah, sure, Jesus was a good man. It's good to follow his example of opposing the imperialism of Rome, of his example of helping the poor. They said, he's just a man. Now he's dead. He's not coming back. Or some of them actually acknowledged that Jesus might have been a little bit more special than just any old man. But they said, yeah, but he just wants you to be happy. He's not really worried about holiness. There's no judgment coming. There's no final accounting. Just live your life the way you want to live it. That's what the false teachers were saying. And it's understandable how, it was, how tempting it is, because none of us like the idea of a final judgment, do we? That means it's all going to come crashing down, whatever, we've, whatever choices we've made. We don't like that idea. And so this was tempting to the people that day. It's tempting for us now to think that there is no final accounting. But Peter, in this letter, strongly asserts that, Peter, that Jesus is coming back. The day of the Lord is approaching. Jesus will return to punish the wicked and those who rebel against God. But he will reward his faithful ones. And now we come to the, we're, we're going to be camping in at the end of the letter here. And Peter has come now full circle. He says again, like he said at the beginning, you have knowledge of the truth. You know that Jesus is coming back. You know that he's coming as a conquering king this time. And that knowledge of truth both requires and enables you to live godly lives. And so he then kind of asks the question, this truth that you know about the return of Christ, how should that affect you? How should then you live your lives? What now must you do? do? And that's the answer, the, the kind of the, posing that question and answering that question is what Peter goes into in our passage today. So this is our passage, 2 Peter chapter 3, we're we'll starting verse 11. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight at peace. Also, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul has written written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters. There are some matters that are hard to understand. The untaught and unstable will twist them to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stable position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. So now, in what we see in this passage, in a familiar pattern that's presented throughout the New Testament, he's presented an important truth. We have this truth. Now, how does that truth affect how we live on a day-to-day basis? That's the pattern we see throughout the New Testament. Here's the truth. Here's that, how that truth affects your life. And that's what Peter presents to us. He's saying that Christ will return. 
He will return at any time, and he will execute justice on the earth. He will punish the wicked, and he will reward the righteous. Okay, that's the truth. Now, how should that truth affect our lives? Well, it should affect both our attitudes and our actions. And that's what Peter's going to describe today, or describes in this passage. So in verses 11 to 13, Peter focuses on the attitude that we should have in view of this truth. What sort of people should we be as we wait for the return of Christ? He starts out in verse 11 with, since all these things are going to be dissolved. Well, what things being dissolved? What is he talking about? We'll go back to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On, the day, on that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. So he's saying, so since the end of the world is coming, in view of that reality, Peter then asks a question. What sort of people should you be? Actually, as I read it in the CSB, it doesn't come as a question. It's unfortunate that the CSB took away the question in their translation of verse 11. I know it's some complicated grammar that it's struggling to translate perhaps, but I think it would have been better to keep the question. If you have a a New American Standard or an ESV on your, on your lap, and you're looking at that, you'll see that they retained the question. Every other major translation retained the question. The question is, what sort of people should you be? I mean, Peter does imply what the answer is to that question, but it's still important to ask the question. We should all be asking the question. In fact, that's the first part of our attitude that Peter is indicating, is that we should be introspective. We should ask the question. We should think carefully. We should look inside our own hearts and consider, what kind of person should I be? What kind of person does God want me to be? We shouldn't just go along blissfully without a care in the world. Just whatever, you know. Because here's the thing we need to realize, that there is a direct connection between, a couple of big words here, eschatology and ethics. In other words, eschatology is what we believe about the last days, about how things end both our own personal lives and how the world ends. And then ethics, of course, is how we live our lives. And so what you believe about the end of life, about the end of the world, will have an effect on how you live, on how you behave. Or it goes the other way around, too. As we, saw, as we see with the false teachers that Peter talks about, how they want to behave caused them to modify what they believed about the end of the world. They wanted to just act however they wanted. And so they kind of removed the idea of a final accounting from their theology. It's not going to happen. This comes even more clearly if you consider for yourselves a a situation like the end of your your own life. What would you do if you had a week to live? If you were told by the doctor you have a week to live, what would you do? How would you live? How would that be different from your daily life that you live right now? It's the same thing when about what we think about the end of the world. So what we believe about the certainty of the end, about the timing of the end, about what happens after the end, all of those beliefs affect how we live today. And so Peter had just reminded his readers, he reminds us that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief. It could come at any time. It could come at a time you don't expect it. And it will burn up the world as we know it. How does that truth affect your life today? How does it affect what you think about or how you think about and how you handle money and how you handle your material possessions? How does it affect your relationships with other people? How does it affect your level of obedience to God's commands in his word? We could also ask it the other direction. When you... what? When, we look at, when you look at what you do, how you actually think about money, how you handle material possessions, how you handle your relationships, your holiness before God, what does your behavior imply about what you think about the end? What does your thinking and your actions imply about how certain you think it is that Jesus is coming back? Or what do your actions imply about what you think about when he will return or how close that return is. What does your behavior show about what you believe what happens after he returns, whether there's a day of reckoning or an accounting? And the implication that Peter is making here in his letter is that knowing the world will end, 
knowing that Jesus could come back at any time, knowing that Jesus' return is a day of reckoning, that should lead us to lead lives of holy conduct and godliness, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But the first thing he's saying about our attitude is that we should ask the question. We should be introspective. We should say, what is my conduct? What is my behavior? How do I think about those things? And does it line up with what I believe or what I say I believe? The first thing is introspective. The second thing about our attitude that Peter keys in on here is that we should be expectant. He says in verse 12, as we wait for the day of God, as we long for that day, as we look forward to that day with eagerness, and we notice that Peter uses that word wait three times here, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14. Wait for the day of God. Wait for the new heavens and new earth. Wait for these things. And what he's saying is this is important. We need to be looking forward to it. This should be on our minds. This is something that's really familiar to those of us who've been in the military and have gone on deployments. We probably understand this idea of waiting better than many. Because after, especially when you're married, after you've been apart for six months or apart for a year, this sense of anticipation and eager waiting can get pretty strong, as you can imagine. You start counting the days. You start thinking about what you're going to do when you get home or when he gets home for the wives. And not everything that you do is connected with that return, with that reuniting. Not, you're not always consciously thinking about it. But it's always in the back of your mind. It's always there. It always sets kind of a context, a backdrop for what you're doing, for your attitudes, for your actions. It's the same way, it should be the same way for us about the return of Christ. We, we're not always consciously thinking about the return of Christ. We, his return doesn't always have a direct connection to what we're doing in that moment. But his return should always be in the background. It should always be context. It should always be shaping our thoughts, shaping our actions. Now, this, as we think about being expectant, it's kind of interesting from this text that there's actually some way in which we can actually hasten the coming of that ultimate day. You notice that? As you, verse 12, as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. So that there's some way in which we can shorten the wait. Part of being expectant is not just passive waiting, but actually active waiting. Now, it may seem a little weird, right? Because we believe in the sovereignty of God. If if, If God is sovereign, he's already set the day when this will happen. And he knows when that day is. So in what way, then, can we hasten the day? What way can we make that happen? And well, this is another place where we don't know the exact integration between God's sovereignty and man's, our, our responsibility for action in this way. We don't. It's one of the most complicated things in all of Scripture. But we know that both are involved. Both are true. Both are clear here in Scripture. God has ordained what will happen, when everything will take place, but he has also ordained that it will take place through people, through human beings. And there's multiple indications in Scripture that our actions in some way have an effect on the day of the Lord and on the return of Christ. Like, for example, there was an indication from the Old Testament prophets that there was a connection between the repentance of Israel and the coming of God to restore all things. So until Israel repents, God will not fulfill the prophecy that he will restore the kingdom because there's a direct connection between their repentance and God's restoration of the kingdom. Peter actually picked up on this in the book of Acts, in his second sermon after the day of Pentecost, after Jesus' ascension, Acts chapter 3. Starting in verse 19, he he was preaching to them. He says, Therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus. Jesus has already left and, and ascended to heaven, or already come once and ascended to heaven, that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Heaven must receive him until the time of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. This sermon was in the temple. Peter was preaching to Israelites. 
And he's saying, repent, so that seasons of repent, or refreshing may come, so that Jesus may come back. So he's saying that when Jesus comes back, there will be this time of refreshing. There will be this restoration of all things. So repent so that he can come back. There's a connection. Now, so for us, one of the ways that we can hasten the coming of the day of the Lord then is by evangelizing the Jewish people because they need to repent in order that this may happen. Another way we can hasten the coming is by evangelizing the nations. This I get from Matthew 24. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 14, This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So once it's proclaimed to all the nations, then the end will come. So our responsibility in bringing about the day of the Lord and the return of Christ is to proclaim the gospel to all the nations. And so that's something that we need to keep doing. Another indication, Jesus told us to pray that it would happen. He said in the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying that Christ would return and establish his throne on earth. Yes, there's a sense in which he's already the king. There's a sense in which his kingdom already is in our hearts. But, the, but his kingdom come, that's talking about him actually being the governmental ruler of the entire earth. The king over all the earth. Your kingdom come. So that kingdom coming involves that whole set of events that are involved with the day of the Lord. So God has sovereignly ordained when and how the day of the Lord will arrive, but part of his plan involves people, including us, through, through presenting the gospel, through prayer, all of that. As we fulfill our responsibilities, and this is heavy to think about, as we forget, fulfill those responsibilities of proclaiming the gospel and praying your kingdom come, we are actually participating in the hastening of the day. That's part of what we mean by a life lived in expectancy. Not just passive expectancy, but active expectancy. That's how we look forward to the return of Christ and how we speed his coming. And then the third part of our attitude that Peter speaks of is that we should be hopeful. Be hopeful. Now it's true, and we see this in this text, that the day of the Lord, that day is a, is a day of judgment. It's a day of destruction. He says that the heavens will be dissolved with fire. The elements will melt with heat. Now, we're not sure whether that description is complete annihilation that he's talking about or just intense purification. But either way, it's not a gentle thing. It's destruction. It's removal of wickedness. And while we should not take pleasure in the deaths of even wicked people, we can look forward to the vindication of the righteous. We can look forward to the justice of God. So that's part of it, but that's not all that the day of the Lord means. It does mean the, that destruction, but it also means, look what Peter says in his description, based on God's promise we wait for, we look forward to a new heavens and a new earth. All of creation will be made new. It will be a place, he says here in the text, where righteousness dwells. In fact, we could also we can say it this way, we could say where only righteousness dwells. Wickedness will be gone. There will be no place for wickedness or sin in any of the new creation. That's something to look forward to. I mean, Peter's probably referencing Isaiah 65 here. And this is what it says, Isaiah 65, verse 17. It says, For I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Then be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating, for I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. And Isaiah goes on to describe an even more idyllic situation. So that's kind of what Peter is picking up on. And that's what we're looking forward to. John describes it in even more detail. Revelation chapter 21. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. 
and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. And get this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things has passed away. That's something to look forward to. So when that day comes, all things will be made new. Earth will be restored to how it was at Eden and even better than the Garden of Eden. The curse that came on creation because of mankind's sin will be gone forever and we will dwell with God. We'll be able to have a perfect relationship with God with no longer a barrier of sin between us. We will have a perfect relationship with him, not only with God, but with each other. And we'll have a perfect relationship even with the created world. That's our great hope. And so when Peter says, look forward to, we could say long for. That's what he's telling us that we should long for. Paul talks about how both we and the rest of creation long for this together with groaning. Romans chapter 8. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the firstfruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. That's hope. So our attitudes should be characterized by hope, and we have so much to look forward to. Most of all, the direct, unmediated presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Perfect relationship forever. So that's the attitude as we wait for the return of Jesus Christ. It should be characterized by a sense of introspection, by an eager expectancy, and by a confident hope. That's our attitude. He also speaks to our actions. Verses 14 and following. What actions should characterize our lives as we wait for the return of Christ? Well, look at verse 14. Peter speaks of waiting. Again, while you wait and look forward to these things. Again, what things are those? Well, it's the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, the new heavens and the new earth. So while you wait for these things, here's what you must do. Well, the first thing we see in verse 14, make every effort. Make every effort. These are words that Peter said a few times in this letter now. Especially back at the beginning of the letter, Peter said in chapter 1, verse 5, he said, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge. And he goes on with this whole list right up to a culmination of the ultimate virtue of love. Make every effort. He also said in chapter 1, verse 10, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. So Peter has now come full circle back around to things he'd emphasized at the beginning. So this must be very important because these are things that he talked about at the beginning of the letter. He's coming back to talk about them again at the end of his letter. And what all this is telling us, God's word is telling us, we need to be diligent. We need to work hard. The Christian life is not a spectator sport. We, we must not be passive. We should not have the same thought that the false teachers that Peter speaks again, against had here, that, you know, Jesus is gone. We can do whatever we want. The cat's away, the mice can play. We, we cannot have that attitude. Rather, we should pay attention to what Jesus said multiple times to do while he was away. Like Luke 12, he speaks of this. Luke 12, he told a couple of parables about a master being gone and what the servants are supposed to do. Verse 36, he said, You are to be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. They're ready. Or verse 43, Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. While Jesus is away, he expects his servants to be working hard at the tasks that he has assigned them. So what are the tasks? Well, the first task here in this passage Make every effort, what? To be found without spot or blemish in his sight. In other words, work toward holiness. This is kind of connected with what he said back in verse 11. He basically told us the answer to the question he wanted us to think about. 
in the view of the approaching day of the Lord, in view of the return of Christ, what sort of people should you be? And he gave a little hint. Well, it has to do with holy conduct and godliness. And so now, uh, was back then, he was kind of like going, here's the, you know, it's the teacher in the classroom giving the foot stomp. Here's going to be the answer on the test. Now he's explicitly exhorting his readers to action. So he comes back to it again. He says, make every effort to live holy lives. Be diligent to live in a way that is pleasing to God. Be diligent to live in a way that is in line with God's character. And the way Peter says this, he's, he's kind of making a backhanded reference to the false teachers. Because earlier he had called them spots and blemishes. And now he's saying to his readers, don't be like them. Don't follow them in indulgent, leader, in, in indulgent living. In fact, rather be without spot and blemish. As God has said, be holy as I am holy. See, you cannot live fruitful lives the way those false teachers were. They have rot in their roots and they're going to ultimately wither away. He's rather saying, make every effort to live holy lives. Make every effort to make your calling sure. How do you make your calling sure? Well, as you work hard to live holy lives, you confirm that the Holy Spirit really is there in your heart, that he really has given you new life. And if the Holy Spirit really has taken up residence in your heart, then you have the calling of God on your life. Then you are called to salvation. Because it's only with the new heart that has been influenced by the Holy Spirit that you will want to live a holy life, that you will be able to work towards a holy life. It's only in the Holy Spirit's power that you can live in a way that's pleasing to God. So as you live lives in accordance with God's revealed character, then it shows that you have the Holy Spirit, and that you are at peace with God. You're no longer hostile. You're no longer enemies and rebels. Now you are his loyal subjects. And so as loyal subjects, as servants of our Lord, we want to be found faithful. We don't want him to return and find us goofing off, disobeying all his rules, bringing dishonor on his house. In fact, that same parable that I mentioned in Luke chapter 12 about the servants Jesus went on to expand on that concept for his disciples. He said in verses 45 and 46, he said, If that servant says in his heart, Oh, my master is delaying in his coming, and then starts to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk, then that servant's master will come on a day he is not expecting him, and at an hour he does not know, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. We do not want to be that servant, the unfaithful servant. Peter says, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish. Do not be lazy. Do not be disobedient. Live in accordance with Lord's character as he has revealed to us in Scripture. We need to be diligently about the work that he has given us. So work towards holiness. In verse 15, we see the next action that we should take. Work to rescue sinners. The text says that regard as patience... Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. And when he says this, he could be talking about our own salvation, or he could be talking about another person's salvation. And as far as our own salvation, earlier Peter had told us that God is patient because he wants people to come to repentance. So the application to this, if you're not saved, is use this time until Christ returns to get saved. Regard this time before Jesus returns as an opportunity to repent of your rebellion against a holy God and to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's one application. But the people that Peter was writing to were most, if not all, already Christians. So his primary application that he has in mind is probably something a little different. His primary application probably when he says, regard the Lord's patience as salvation, he's talking about for those other people that you know. Use this time until Christ returns to call people to repentance. To call people to put their faith in Christ. Present the gospel to them and exhort them to believe. God's patience in not having returned yet is their opportunity for salvation. And you do this for everyone. Your family, your friends, your co-workers, someone on the sports field, someone at the store, someone at the doctor's office. I mean, what did... Jesus assigned to his disciples as their task when he left. Right, you're probably thinking of the Great Commission. 
And it is, Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all I have commanded them, baptizing them. He gives another a similar commission in Luke 24. We also see a commission, the commission given in, in Acts chapter 1. I already referenced that passage once. Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven, and he gives his last charge, and it's a connected to his return. This is what you do until I return. Now remember, he had taught his disciples. We're talking about, again, we're talking about Acts chapter 1 right now. He taught his disciples how necessary it was for the Messiah to, to suffer. They, that was something they didn't really understand. He was to suffer first for the redemption of lost sinners. Now they got it. He had died on the cross. He had showed them that suffering had to come first before some of the other things that the Old Testament prophesies were true about uh, Messiah and what would happen when he came. So all those other things, restoration of Israel, punishment of God's enemies, reversal of the curse, he, they now understood that, that suffering had to come first. And so now that he's actually died and now he's resurrected, it's natural for the disciples to ask, people, ask Jesus, okay, all that suffering stuff has happened, right? I mean, you died, now you're resurrected, so now you're going to do all that good stuff? Now you can do the restoration of Israel. Now you can reverse the curse. It says in Acts chapter 1, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? They're asking, is it time? Will you now conquer your enemies? Now will you be executing justice? Is the day of the Lord starting now? And notice Jesus' answer. He said for them, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. So Jesus basically told them, that's not happening now, and you don't need to know when it's happening. It might happen tomorrow. It might happen in 2,000 years. You don't need to know. What you do need to know is you need to get busy at what I told you to do. You just need to get about the task that I have assigned you. You will be my witnesses. That's their task. You will be my witnesses. You will attest to the truth of my death and burial and resurrection, and you will call upon the nations to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. And then it goes on as Jesus ascended into heaven and the cloud hid him from you. The disciples are still staring up into heaven. And the angels are standing there, and you know, they kind of reinforce Jesus' point. What are you doing looking up into heaven? He's told you what you're supposed to be about doing. Get busy. Go be his witnesses. Yes, he's coming back, but it's not in the next five minutes. You have your marching orders. Get about it. Go call people to repent and believe. And it's the same thing for us. That is the task we have before us. We need to be busy about the Lord's work. So regard the patience of our Lord as salvation is saying that we have time right now until he returns to be about that work of calling people to salvation, to repentance. So think of this time while we wait for the return of Christ as your chance to rescue more people. So keep throwing out that lifeline to people drowning in their sins. Keep pleading with people to repent of their wickedness and their rebellion and call on Jesus to save them. Keep doing that until he comes back. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Then there's an interesting point here in our text that Peter kind of supports that idea that about we're supposed to be about this task of, of calling people to salvation by saying that Paul's doing this too. He's telling you the same thing. St. Paul also writes to the churches that what we need to be doing while we wait for Jesus to return is to be diligent in striving for holiness and to be working hard at proclaiming the gospel. Paul's saying the same thing. And Peter probably brings this up because these false teachers were probably had been using Paul's teaching as an excuse. Like, well, he says we're not under the law anymore. We can live however we want. They're using Paul's teaching twisted to support what they wanted to do anyway. But that's not not at all what Paul's point was, as you know. I mean, like Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Should we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Absolutely not. And what it shows is that the false teachers were either really confused and didn't understand what Paul was saying, or they were deliberately twisting it to say what they wanted to say. Now, I want to just make a quick little side note here that it's fascinating how much you can learn sometimes in Scripture from just these 
side comments and sidebars that aren't even the main point of the passage, just like an offhand comment that the, the writer makes, and how much we can sometimes learn from those. Just a couple things to notice from what Peter says in this little sidebar about Paul. First of all, he calls him dear brother. My, our dear brother Paul. So many people try to put Peter and Paul at odds with each other. Uh, sometimes they use as evidence the book of Galatians where Paul says that he rebuked Peter publicly. Sometimes they, they try to drive a wedge between their theological perspectives that Paul and Peter disagreed with each other. Rather, in, this, in contrast, what Peter says here shows this warm affection, a strong mutual respect between the men. It shows that they had a consistency of theological understanding. They weren't at odds with each other. They knew that they were teammates in the same glorious mission. They were fellow servants of the same Lord. That's one thing we see. We also see here that Peter had an awareness of the letters that Paul was writing to the churches. He already knew about the letters that Paul was writing. And this indicates that those letters were already being circulated. They were already kind of making the rounds. Copies were made. They were passed around to the churches. We don't know exactly which letters Peter's referring to here, which ones he knew about, but obviously some. And it's really interesting that Peter groups Paul's letters in with the rest of the scriptures. What does that mean? That means Paul's letters were already being regarded as scripture, as God's word, as authoritative. So they didn't take on legendary status after hundreds of years, and then finally people started thinking of them as God's word and authoritative. They were already known to be from God. And he also, another thing, Peter acknowledges that not everything in the scriptures are easy to understand. But they can be understood, they just might take a little work. But the essential things are clear. So the main problem is not the difficulty of the concepts, the main issue is whether you want to understand them in God's way, want to understand his truth, whether you submit to its way. So the problem is when people insert their own meaning or twist the scriptures to mean what they want, as the false teachers were doing. So Peter says that's their own destruction. It does harm to others. It harms, the, it shames Christ, but the ultimately the one destroyed is the one doing the twisting. So you can see all those things you can learn just in this little sidebar comment that Peter makes. Really fascinating. But back to Peter's main point. He says, while we wait for Jesus to return, we need to get busy. We need to work hard. We need to work, and Paul says the same thing is what he's implying. We need to work hard in obedience to God's word to grow in holiness. And we also need to proclaim the good news of salvation to the salvation in Christ to a lost world. The witness to Christ's love and mercy. And what he's saying is as we do that, we play our part to rescue sinners from the coming judgment. Those are the things we need to be working hard at. And then as we get to the end, of, even closer to the end of the letter, Peter summarizes his final exhortation. This is a sense also a summary of his main point for the whole letter, that this time between the advents is going to be a time of conflict. It's going to be a time of war. It's going to be a time of difficulty. It's going to be a time of struggle. The war is primarily going to be a war of ideas. And in this battle of ideas, this battle of truth and error, you need to have both a good defense and a good offense. And so in verse 17, Peter says, be on guard. This is the defense. This is the, four, the third action of our four that he talks about. While we wait for Jesus to return, be on guard. Be aware. Be ready for opposition. You know, Peter's already given warning earlier in the letter and in the first letter that persecution was coming. Persecution would be not pleasant. But the bigger threat, he says, is not the persecution. It's actually the false teachers that come up from within the church. That's the biggest threat. They had come already in Peter's time, and they will continue to rise up until Jesus returns. So we need to be on guard. We cannot allow ourselves to be led astray by their errors. What does that mean as far as what you need to do? Well, it means you need to know the truth thoroughly so you can recognize error when you see it. That's why it's so important to read your Bible. Read your Bible. (laughs) Study the Bible. Listen to sound preaching of the Word. What else does it mean? It means you need to be willing to call a spade a spade. If you see error, you need to call out error. You need to be willing to call it out and to warn other people of the error. You need to do this so you don't fall away from the faith. That's what Peter says. Now, when he says, don't fall away from the faith, he's not saying you can lose your salvation. Obviously, if you're truly saved, God guarantees the security of your salvation. 
but he secures your salvation by enabling you to guard yourself, to be on guard, to discern error, to persevere. So what Peter's doing, he's focusing on our responsibility in this. Be on guard. God guarantees our salvation by empowering us to work for it, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So be, that's the defense. Be on guard. Do not let yourself be led astray. And then the offensive side of the fight. This is the fourth action in our list. Verse 18, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do you grow in grace? That's a question, isn't it? If grace is God's favor toward us, how do you grow in it? Do you get more grace? Do you have to earn more grace? What does it mean to grow in grace? Well, to grow in grace means to grow in the context of grace. To grow as you are empowered by grace. To grow because of grace. A good illustration is a plant. A plant grows in sunlight. It grows because the sun shines on it. Its ability to grow comes because of sunlight. That's what grow in grace is like. So, Spread the leaves of your heart into the sunshine of God's grace and take advantage of all the resources he has so graciously given in order to grow. Just as a plant takes advantage of the sunlight and of the water and of the nutrients in the soil, it grows, so also we should take advantage of the resources we are given to grow. Well, what has God graciously given us? He's given us knowledge of Jesus Christ, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in that knowledge. Get to know him better through the book that he has written. Get to know him better by trusting him to provide for you. Get to know him better by stepping out in obedience to try something new and scary. Like, I don't know, maybe presenting the gospel to your neighbor or to someone at work. God has given you all you need for life and godliness, Peter wrote at the very beginning of the letter. All you need. He has given you his word. He has given you his Holy Spirit. He has given you the fellowship of fellow believers in the church. He has given his love. He has given his grace. So use the resources he has graciously given in order to live a life pleasing to him, in order to grow in godliness and to accomplish the task he has given. The end of the world is coming. It is. Jesus is coming back. But now since we know that, since we know the end of the dear, end of the world is coming, since we know the end is near, what do we do with the time we have left? Or we could put it this way, since it's New Year's Eve, you have a new year before you. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to live in this new year? What will you resolve to do? The question is, will you focus on yourself? Or will you focus on the glory of Jesus Christ? and on the increase of his kingdom, and on the good of the lost people all around us. So my friends, let us make use of the resources that God has given us, graciously given us. Let us grow and produce fruit for the good of the kingdom of God's beloved Son, and for the glory of his name. By making use of all that God has given us, we can thrive, and we can bear fruit, even in difficult times all for his glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Our God, we praise you and we thank you for the promise that Jesus is coming back. No, we long for that day. But Lord, we ask that you would help us to be found faithful on that day when he returns. That we would be about the task that you have set before us that we be diligent in it, and that when you return, you will be pleased. We ask that that day would come even more quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.